thank you so much for choosing to spend a part of your day with us. Here in the U.S., we are on the cusp of Thanksgiving week. So I hope you all are having a nice Friday and some of you are maybe getting ready for the holiday ahead. My name is Val Riley. I'm head of content and digital marketing at Insightly CRM, and I'm going to be your host for today's webinar. For those of you who are Insightly customers, thank you so much. And I hope there are a few future customers out there as well. Uh, first, please say hi to Lindsay Cordell. Lindsay helps businesses make go-to-market simple as an industry analyst and founding partner at GTM Partners. She has expertise in all areas of go-to-market, sales operations, CRM, product development, and digital advertising. Please also say hello to Jay Baer. Jay is a business growth and customer experience strategist and researcher and author. He is a seventh, yes, I said seventh generation entrepreneur, author of seven best-selling books, and the founder of five multi-million dollar companies. He is also the second most popular tequila influencer in the world. Jay has advised hundreds of major brands worldwide on how to acquire more customers and how to maintain customer relationships they've already earned. Well, after that, it's a little bit hard to introduce anyone else, but I'd like you to meet our moderator for today, Chip House. Chip is CMO of Insightly. He's also my boss. He's responsible for Insightly's marketing strategy, messaging, content, digital marketing, and lead generation for the company. He has more than 25 years experience in senior marketing roles at fast growth SaaS companies. And he's led Insightly CRM for marketing at Insightly CRM for two years. And I'm Val, you've already met me. I'm here to ensure we have a smooth show. We also had a poll open and I'd like to go ahead and reveal those results. Chip, it looks like, um, well, it looks like all of the above because everybody wants those tequila wrecks, huh? Yeah, it seems like it. And I do recommend them because Jay, I think, even released his own tequila at some point this year. So, Jay, you can talk about that more later, but like clearly AI is going to be big this year. So, well, let's let's get kicked off. Thanks so much, Val. Um, so, as Val mentioned, we're, we're hoping to talk about small and mid-sized businesses today and some great new research that we just conducted. Um, but they rely heavily on their marketing technology or MarTech to enable efficiencies of smaller teams, as well as to improve overall marketing performance. But what kind of impact can MarTech have on mid-sized businesses? Also, how can marketers overcome challenges by harnessing the power of MarTech? And so to help you answer this question, we worked with Ascend2 and we conducted some research called the future of MarTech 2024. And we launched that survey in just in September of this year. And we're gonna be sharing some of those results in addition to some other research that we've done and that GTM Partners has done, as well as uh, other data from across the space. So uh, this, this report titled the future of MarTech 24 represents the opin opinions of 310 marketing professionals responding to the survey who represent companies with fewer than 500 employees. So, you know, MarTech stack really is a pretty significant investment for most marketers. This is one of the questions we asked. Most marketers spend at least 10% of their revenue or, or of their, their spend rather on uh, the marketing stack. And many, as you can see, spend more than 20% of their budget so it is a pretty significant spend and uh you know so hopefully there's gonna be some important takeaways for you today and let's look at the agenda so we promised you six takeaways uh for 2024 so you can start your planning and budgeting to and feeling prepared so let's launch into this and bring up uh my co-panelists here so our first takeaway for 2023 is about of course AI. And so AI caused a panic in 2023 or lots of excitement in addition to panic. But if you weren't prepared, it seemed like a panic. Uh, but we'll see even more changes in 2024. And so two data points emerged about a AI in this research. So you can see we asked which trend will have the most impact and AI, artificial intelligence, showed up number one, personalization number two, data privacy and compliance number three. So, Jay, does this surprise you? 
No, I think everybody's default answer is AI, even if they don't really know what that means uh, or, or how it will impact their actual job. It's sort of a, a a reflex answer because working with a lot of, of different brands and also a lot of professional services firms on the marketing consulting side now, there's there's really only two things that AI can do for you. It can either allow you to make more at the current cost or make the same at less cost, right? That, that's the only two options, right? And so you almost have to kind of through as an organization, which of those makes the most sense to you? Are you trying to increase output or decrease time and cost in order to create the output that you already have? Uh, and, and you know, to me, AI is a little bit like social media in that it is an ingredient. It's not, it's not the entree. When, when business leaders say, what we need is more AI, I kind of laugh at that. I'm like, to do what exactly? Like what? Yes, it's amazing technology and it's going to get more amazing. Like granted, I'm not anti-AI or I'm not bullish on it. I am. But but I think we got to be really careful that we don't just say, bring me some of that AI. Like it's not, it's just it's such, a, it's such an abstract concept, right? Just be like, give me artificial intelligence. Uh, I don't know. Lindsay, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think um, and I apologize for my voice, everybody. AI in particular is interesting because people are, they need ways of scaling. Labor continues to be very expensive. And that's where these companies are really leaning into the opportunity of scaling in a much bigger way. Um, we know how important personalization is. We also know that it's very expensive to do it without the machine supporting us. So AIs are going to be that scaling machine that helps you take your already fantastic concepts to the next level. If you're starting without a fantastic concept, it's not gonna deliver it to you. It is going to create some pretty interesting garbage that you definitely should not market with. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and see now is you know, a lot of brands, um, big companies in particular, because as I think we've all heard or experienced ourselves, AI can hallucinate, AI can give you information that is absolutely incorrect, dangerously wrong, right? So a lot of big brands, Apple, uh, Samsung, Spotify, Bank of America, et cetera, have flat out banned the use of AI in their in their workforce because they're concerned about, you know, accidentally leaking corporate secrets, giving a consumer something that's that's incorrect and somehow harmful. And and to me, that's going to be really interesting over the next, say, six months to sort of see how how that shakes out. A lot of smart people are working on this idea of kind of AI with guardrails, right? So so AI, um, you know, with a with a dull knife. <laughs> and and so it'll be interesting to see what the implications are of that. Yeah, Jay, when we were talking before, you referred to AI as an ingredient, not an entree. And I, I kind of I love that. Um, Val, can we can we bring up the, the slide to look at uh, just how people expect the role of AI in marketing technology to evolve in the future? So one of the, the top things that came out was improved content personalization. Mm -hmm. um, and so as Lindsay, if, if super, super important, right? I mean, I think we all know that that consumers prefer a hyper personalized experience because it speaks to relevancy. It speaks for respect for time. Uh, and and as Lindsay so adroitly pointed out, like personalization can be expensive and time consuming and hard. And, and AI can certainly uh, it, it help with that. And you can see it's the, the number one expectation amongst uh, survey participants is that AI will help with content personalization. Content generation makes sense to me too, right? Because it's like, give me a blog post, click, done, uh, that that kind of thing. And, and then some of these other um, use cases uh, I, I find pretty interesting uh, as well. Customer segmentation, right? That's a the last one on the list. So that's a very specific use case. Uh, but I think it's really interesting to consider how AI can make that easier. For sure. And I think a lot has been talked about with AI, like for blog posts or web content specifically, especially if you're trying to appeal to Google, you have to think about the EEAT uh, acronym and just the fact that you are trying to write content that shows you have expertise in a certain topic, correct? Yeah. And, and you know, people get wrapped around the axle a lot about, hey, can we actually compete in an SEO world when all this content can be created so quickly by AI tools. And what I like to 
argue is that AI doesn't stand for artificial intelligence. It stands for average information. Uh, and, and consequently, <laughs> like if, you know, the problem is not that, that AI can do what marketers can do. The problem is that most marketers are only doing stuff that's as good as AI can do. So if you want to outperform AI in search or in any context, do better work, right? Like, like create interesting, dynamic, creative, strategic content that, that AI can't match. You know, I think, look, I'm just going to be honest about this. There's so much mediocre content created by human beings. And of course, that's going to be disintermediated by robots, of course. And it should, right? So I've been telling people for the last few months, like, make less stuff, but make stuff better. That's, that's the secret, if you ask me. I, I love it so much, Jay. I, I knew that you would come up with a, another great quotable quote. And uh, <laughs> so with, with that, I want to make sure, we, we, since we're trying to target 40, 45 minutes here today, let's move on to point number two and get your impressions about that. So our business is done shedding SaaS. 2023 was coined the great app layoff by Saster, where 10% or more of many orgs app stack was cut. And we have a quote from Saster that reads, everyone around the table just cut apps from each department. Not all of them, but in many cases, the number of apps shrunk by about 10% or so. And for the rest, uh, the IT or finance departments tried to manage costs down, right? So we're sort of in this area of MarTech efficiency, and we expect that some of that to continue in 2024. But, you know, do we think it's over or not? Um, so according to a report from G2, buyer behavior in the SaaS space has shifted. And we have this great data from Lindsay uh, slash Marge, Marge Simpson today. And Lindsay, can you talk us through this data? Um, so the, the one of the most interesting things about this buyer's market is that I think there's a misconception that people aren't buying what people are, they're reticent to buy because they're being held accountable to usage in a completely new way by their organizations. And so what people are buying is things that are easy to implement, that have quick ROI, that can scale with the team and that aren't going to be a headache that they're going to have to defend in next year's budget meetings. So what's really important for the people developing software right now is that they need to be focused on creating software that does have high usability. They are focused on touting the adoption of their current customers. They need to be focused on continuing driving adoption in their current customers because that's where people are shopping and that's where we're going to win. To be clear, we have not seen intent decline at all on G2. It is higher every year. And while G2 is continuing to be pretty popular and increasing their base, the fact that we're not seeing drop-offs in intent interest, we're seeing new categories get developed monthly. There are still shoppers out there who are just being held to a different standard internally that's impacting the decisions they're making at the buying time. Yeah, there's an element here that I thought was really interesting there because you highlight risk reduction, right? So in, in in a time where people are trying to be just more efficient with their spend, I, I heard the term fear of effing up recently as, a, as a, a strong impactor of buyers out there, right? They're just afraid to make yep. a mistake, right? And so that risk is really important to them. But Jay, what are your thoughts when you look at this? Well, especially in an uncertain economy, and there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. Um, I think the tendency is to is to shed yourself, um, uh, but you got to make got to make sure that you're not you know sh shedding the bed as well, um, because yes, I think we are exiting an era where we looked at sort of SaaS ownership as the goal. Like, look at how many things we acquired. We we've got this amazing tech stack. People would say like. Look at the size of our tech stack, right? Like, like it's the size of a house or an RV or something, right? Like, I don't know that that's necessarily a, a badge of honor to have more software, uh, but that's why this this kind of pivot, as Lindsay pointed out, to to usage, right? It's not about what do you own; it's about what do you use. 
as probably it always should have been, but it wasn't. We got a little over our skis, I think, a little bit there. So I love seeing that first one, right? That that the primary consideration or the, or the first consideration is ease of implementation. Now, again, ease of implementation doesn't have net present value either. It's only because if it's easier to implement, it, you can spin it up faster, and presumably you will use it faster and more often and more consistently. So uh, I think everybody's instincts are actually pretty sound here. It's like, hey, let's figure out what is integral to the business, like CRM, right? That's not one that you're going to be like, well, we just don't need a CRM anymore. Uh, you know, it, it's so fundamental, it's like the nerve center of the whole operation. So I think that's the thing. We start to see some of these point solutions, which do a tiny thing that maybe you don't need to do that often in your business. I think that's kind of a tough road to hoe uh, for, for those kind of companies. Makes good sense. You know, what? one of the things I love about this G2 research is it's all driven by customers, right? And I, I know at GTM Partners, you get a lot of your data in that way, Lindsay. Um, and it was really interesting to me that time to ROI showed up as a, a heavily driving factor now for where people are spending their money. And, you know, I know that we did uh, a study with you, or you rather you did a study on it, uh, the ROI of Insightly this summer. Do, do you, can you comment on that really quickly? Yeah, absolutely. So we love working with partner vendors and SaaS. Um, Insightly is one of them, but um, we're not just going to trust you when you tell us your customers love us. Um, so we look in the backend data of G2. So these are not handpicked customers that you gave to us to understand their experience and value. These are all of your customers that have gone on G2, taken the time, and have answered specific questions about their experience. And we love seeing a go live time. I was a head of RevOps and have installed Salesforce five times now. And I can't even imagine a CRM go live of 1.1 months. So it's really impressive to see this type of ROI and go live. And just, I love that customers are really pushing their technology partners that we can't get away with 12 month installs anymore. Business moves too quickly. The need is too great if you're in a buying cycle. So it's really impressive what you and the team have done and you guys should be very proud. Thank you, Lindsay. And I know you have some more data on the next slide to, to, to talk to. I do, if you guys can bear to hear me talk. <laughs> so bad. No, you're doing great. Um, you're doing great. You're too kind. So when it comes to um, what people are focused on in growth, an interest in total relevant market is continuing. People are trying to figure out where to spend money, where to draw the, where to draw their market potential from. So we love that that continues to be a focus. Brand and demand also continues to be a focus. Um, however, I think one of the things that's most interesting is we look at the growth in revenue operations over the past two years has continued to be extremely high. And um, the other area of great interest to us is that the pipeline velocity continues to be of interest, but it's starting to, to tick down. But it's a major issue that's still occurring. So I'm very excited to get our 23, 2023 data set from G2 because it's been a wild year in terms of adoption and usage. But as I said before, adoption and usage is higher today than it was in 2022 versus 21 and 20. So technology is not going anywhere. So while people are selecting their vendors and their partners more carefully, I don't know that the shedding of SaaS is gonna be a long-term plan given how much buyer and we're observing. Makes sense. So, I mean, there's, in general, there's pressure to have fewer vendors. I mean, that's one of the things that emerges from this. And, you know, also from the research, we looked at integrations and we asked about that. And uh, so this, the chart on the next slide here, you can see that 88% say that their integrations are very, very important to their business, you know, strongly agree, or at least somewhat agree that the integrations are really, really important. Um, so, you know, if you're willing to have one platform for multiple uses, 
it truly just has to be effective, meaning that an app rollup via acquisition where there's all different data sets really isn't the same as a modern platform designed to work together from the ground up with the same database, sort of the same view of the customer, if you will. And some businesses are willing to give up functionality to have functionality to have one platform across all functions. It puts them in a better position to negotiate deals, payment plans with one vendor versus many, right? I mean, so that just makes it easier, probably easier on your CFO as weather or, or as well. Um, Jay, we talked about this. I thought it was funny. You said you've seen this movie before. Yeah, I, I feel like this is a, a, a cyclical business premise where we go into a period of, I don't know, Lindsay's probably got a better handle on it than I do. Um, I don't know, three to five year cycle, maybe, um, where it's like, okay, the best way to run your marketing is to have sort of this super app that does all the things, right? And we're only paying for one company, but it does everything. We got one login and we got one contract. And then people say, you know, actually, it's impossible to be best to breed at everything inside one piece of software. So maybe we should decouple all of that and, and have five different licenses doing five different things instead of one license doing five things. And then people do that for a while. And they're like, boy, this is sure hassle to have so many vendors and different contracts for SaaS. And we got to learn different uh, UXs and UIs. Let's just go back to having one, right? And I feel like we just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth uh, or over time. And maybe it's because I'm old now. I just, that's why I say, I feel, like, I feel like I've seen this movie before. And it's the same movie that actually happens on the services side too, right? There's always this like push pull between you should have one marketing services firm doing everything, or you need to have an SEO firm and a content firm and a social firm, right? And a copywriting firm and a video firm or one that does everything, right? It's the same kind of back and forth. So um, I, I, I suspect, um, well, actually, I don't know. I don't know. With 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 AI, I, I like the idea where AI isn't necessarily a bunch of different nodes. It's baked into all the different software itself, right? So maybe that means that that uh, it makes more sense to have sort of one super app, but I don't know. It's probably depends on the CMO and what they think too. Lindsay, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it is if you are coming to the table with a need for your business, that's very clear. And you can say, I can hire a $70,000 resource or I can buy an $8,000 app, what do you think they're gonna do? So as long as you can prove the need, if there is a specialized app that supports that need, they're gonna go for the cheaper option. So it's a little bit of a pipe dream, this idea of one contract will reduce our tech spend. If you need to hire people to replace what that app can do, then that's gonna cost you way more money. So- that's really. At the end of the day, I think the push towards defining your need in a very explicit way so the business can understand it and really calculate the ROI, that's what needs to happen. And if it is one big app that can do it all, great. That's amazing. If it's 10 apps because your business has specific needs that are niche in the way it behaves, then that's great too. As long as you're not hiring human resources to do what technology can because the risk there is is that two years from now you're laying off those resources because the business got too expensive to support how much revenue you actually generate so i think it always comes down to money i just don't think it has anything to do with the number of contracts that the finance team has to field this year or next Right. But in, in many ways, the winning apps will be able to impact multiple teams. Right. And that, that seems to be also emerging from the research as being sort of a consistent point. Um, so let's make sure we move on here because I, I want to make sure that we get to all six points here. And uh, but you can see, see, see there in the research that uh, it is important that, uh, you know, the apps that are getting chosen do provide value for multiple teams. But uh, I'm, I'm a little bit with you, Jay, though. It's like not all movies age with time, right? So they're, they're often worse the second time around. I just watched the original Halloween 
and it was nowhere near as good as it was when I was 12 years old. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, and some um, movies now are problematic too, right? You watch like Revenge of the Nerds, you're like, oh my, that is not okay to say anymore. <laughs> this yeah, is a little so cringe. Times are times are changing. Okay, so that's a good seed to talking about people. And uh, just to make sure everyone out there is still awake, let's do a quick question to the group. Drop a number in the chat, if all of you will, for how many you people, or excuse me, excuse me, how many people you think are in a typical buying committee in a B2B setting in 2023? And I'll just pause for a second while people plop that in. So how many people do you think salespeople are trying to impact in a B2B sale? Some good answers, three, two, five, ten. And there's different research out here. I've seen Forrester, I've seen Gartner, but according to G2, uh, it's growing. In 2021, the average size was 6.8 people. And in 2022, it was 7.1. So it's actually gone up. And let's get into those dreaded buying committees that popped up with the vengeance in the last couple of years as indicated by this graph, rising costs and staying within budget will continue to be a top concern. So in 2024, a good way to ensure your apps make it into the budget is, is to show value for multiple teams like we, like we talked about uh, and being able to de-risk it. So, But if you've got multiple teams who are gonna benefit from it, each of those teams wants to have a seat in the meeting, right? So it ipso facto creates the size of the buying committee. What's interesting is a lot of apps are creating, I mean, there's a lot of what happens inside of marketing solutions that can benefit a CS team or can benefit a sales team. What's different this year compared to years past is that if there is a benefit to another team, instead of it just being a note of like, oh yeah, that's cool. If I ever want to do that one day as a CS team, marketing, I might use this tool one day, you are blessed, you may buy this solution. Um, now, when that solution is being purchased, the CFO is demanding, look, if it has functionality for CS, you've got to use it CS, I'm going to hold you accountable to that. So it's completely changed the dynamic of what we used to refer to as the approver in the buying committee. They weren't like an active participant in the sales cycle. They just needed to green light it in the event that they weren't also trying to buy a competing piece of software. But in this day and age, the expectation is, is there are no approvers. If there is CS tech infused in the CRM purchase you're making, then, C then the CS team has to change the way they work. They have to adopt the new technology. It has to be a go-to-market decision. And so that's what's really changed and what's elongating a lot of sales cycles is the fact that we're expected to use all pieces of the software these days and CFOs won't say yes unless the entire buying committee agrees to participate. So I don't know if any of you all are experiencing that right now, but that's a lot of what our customers and our research is telling us. Makes sense. Jay, you talked about like the riches in the niches are maybe becoming less relevant. Do you want to talk more about that? Yeah. I mean, there, there's always been this notion that that you can make a super finely tuned piece of software that, so, that serves a very specific function or maybe even a less specific function, but a very specific industry. And I feel like that's a trickier proposition, especially in an uncertain economy, um, partially because it it, it isn't de-risked, right? A lot of times those are, are so niche and so specialty, there isn't a ton of um, customer feedback present. And so you're sort of taking a, a, a you know, a, a wish uh, on making sure that that software is going to do what it says it does. And and look, when, when people are not super confident in budgets, they just take fewer chances. I mean, you know, it's it's the old nobody gets fired for hiring IBM idea, right? Um, so there, there are definitely riches in the niches, um, but you've got to be better than ever, I think, as a software company at explaining to people why that niche is right for the buyer, right? Like, like okay, we, we built this just for your exact use case. 
um, because I don't think they'll take it on face value right now. Yeah, I totally agree. And I want to make sure that we can take that thought and move to the next one, because the other thing that's em emerging is apps that are actually improving the customer experience seem to be winning based on the, the research. And, you know, this in this situation, we're quoting from some other research we did with Ascend to earlier last year. And it, it, it basically says that those organizations with the best customer experiences are two and a half times more likely to report significant growth than all others. But we have some other data that you shared, Lindsay, that shows there's actually a dip in customer satis satisfaction and experience. Can you talk more to that? Yeah, so what we're seeing here is that customer satisfaction um, is greatly connected to our ability <laughs> to retain these customers. Doesn't seem crazy, does it? But it's interesting because that UI, people are less likely to fight software today. And I don't know if it's just as Gen Z who's experienced much of their use of technology through their phones and through apps and through ease of use and through simplicity have a higher expectation, but people are not sitting there going through um, web, going through um, help articles to try and figure out how to use their CRM anymore. They're calling somebody or they're just not using it. And so it's really imperative that as we look at the customer satisfaction index, and as we see this improve over time, the more reliant on technology we became after COVID, the higher our expectations became on that technology supporting us and supporting us without us having to take, you know, eight trailhead courses in order for us to use <laughs> this technology. So it's really critical that this be infused in the work that you're doing today. Yeah. Jay, you had a well, quote from a that. book you wrote called Hug Your Haters, show, yeah. which showed that 80% of companies say they deliver outstanding customer service, but only 8% of their customers agree. What do you yes. think about that? Uh, same is still true now, sadly. Um, that was Gartner's research initially. And I think the ACSI kind of shows it here. Businesses always, especially software companies, always think that their stuff is easier to use than it is because they know where all the buttons go because they built it, right? Like, like, of course, of course, it's easy for you. You are in this tool all day and or you designed this tool. So shocking that you think, well, all you got to do is know that this pull down menu does this other pull down menu. It's like, bro, nobody's going to figure that out no, other than you and you work here. So I think that's the fundamental I issue. But I love that that customers are now saying in all these different research studies, hey, this matters to us. Because I got to tell you, when we're coming out of a period, COVID, where everything was hard, the one thing we can all agree on is now we want easy. And the easiest business will win. It doesn't matter if it's software or you're selling trucks or rutabagas or whatever. It doesn't matter. The easiest business will win eventually. Look at music, okay? Spotify sounds like crap. It's terrible. It's way worse than CDs. It's way worse than records. It's way worse than cassettes. It's probably worse than eight tracks, but it's globally dominant because it's the easiest. Like easy will always win eventually and it wins faster in an era where people are just sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I think software companies need to really lean into ease of use, even if they got to strip out some lesser use features, because I think it's a net positive. And I got to tell you, just unsolicited commercial, this is why I use Insightly every single day, because for me, it's the easiest to use. And if I can save 10 seconds every time I put in a record into my CRM, over the course of a year, that's real money. That's real money, real savings. So uh, I, I love this trend as a CX professional uh, and I hope it continues. Yeah, our our CEO Singram has the best quote. I feel like make it, don't make your customers burn calories to get something done. And I just think that that's such a good perspective to have is if you are making your customers have to really think to accomplish a task, they get exhausted at the end of the day. Take the decision fatigue from them 
and they will thank you and they will be committed to you as a partner. And so always think that, am I burn? Am I forcing my customers to burn calories to get this thing done? And if the answer to that is yes, try harder, make it easier for them. They will thank you. They will thank you through renewal and through price and through speed to purchase and all the things that matter most today. That's a great segue, Lindsay, be, be to the last and final point here is just the, the benefit by treating your customers well and making it easy for them, which is why in the CX space, there's a scoring methodology called the customer effort score, right? Because simply making it easier makes it better on your customers and they're more likely to refer you and recommend you to via word of mouth. And Jay, you've written a ton about this, right? And you're seeing data here from customer referrals, former users, partners, but um, what, what's your thought about this, this current data? I mean, it's, it's not surprising at all, is it? I, I said this the other day in a presentation on stage that because of the way AI is going to change how people access information and how they search for information, I, I believe that everybody's website will become steadily less important from this day forward. Your website will be less important tomorrow than it is today and less important uh, the day after that. What will become more important every day for the rest of eternity is word of mouth. Because the one thing that AI can't disrupt is honest human recommendations and referrals. It can't fake that. Your customers going out of their way to say, you know what? You should buy Insightly because Jay says it's the easiest to use and saves him time. You you can't fake that. You can't robot that. Um, and and the challenge is that most businesses either don't put sufficient emphasis on word of mouth and referrals, or they believe that referrals will come strictly because they do a good job. And and that's not how referrals work, right? You have to have a story to tell that's beyond just, hey, I paid for software and it was pretty good. It did exactly what I thought. That's not a story. No one's going to go out of their way to tell that, right? So there's got to be something that happens that's outside the frame of reference, frame of expertise, frame of expectation. That's what the story becomes. And, and that is, that is you can do all of that proactively. You just have to understand its importance inside your organization and then build a program that actually creates a disproportionate number of honest referrals from your customers. I love that perspective, Jay. So we preach this a lot. Obviously, I spend a lot of time in G2 data and I can tell as an analyst when companies have taught their customers how to talk about the value they experienced versus customers that are just letting their customers figure it out on their own. And so if you're not helping your customers understand your value because you're the expert in your value, they are not, they're just your users. So if you can help them understand it, they will talk about it. They'll talk about it in a meaningful way that's helpful to other shoppers. If you just let them go, and just ask them to do it without any guidance, you're going to get watered down responses that are in categories that maybe don't quite match who you are. And it's very clear in the data, the companies that are winning at helping their customers see value and the customer and the clients out there that are making their customers burn calories to talk about them. So help your customers help you create programming that can support this motion. They want to do it. They're spending their time. Help them do it well so that you're both benefited from that time and effort. And Lindsay, Thank didn't you, you Lindsay. say uh, that that those leads that come from a customer referral closes like way faster? Like there's actually, I mean, I've got data on this in my books, but not like you have for B2B that like it actually has like the material financial impact. It does. Like there are some companies and it kind of varies from company to company, but there are some companies saying that it closed 50 to 70% faster. We've got some customers that tell us that um, they're 3x more likely to close a deal from a previous buyer um, versus someone who's cold off the street. Um, yeah. And when we look at the partner results in the recent study that we've launched on partner led growth, we're seeing higher opportunity win rate for cut for customer um, sourced opportunities and influenced. So even if your partner is just handing off an opportunity, it's closing 
as, as closing 50% faster. If they are generating the opportunity, it's closing twice as fast. And in this day and age with the sales velocity being where it is for a lot of companies, that's just a motion that we can't afford to ignore anymore. So definitely check out that research on partner-led growth from go-to-market partners. It's going to be really eye-opening in the value of partnerships. I'll drop the link in a minute. Um, so yeah, thanks That's for awesome. Me. Well, Lindsay and uh, Jay, thank you so much. That was awesome. Really appreciated your thoughts. I think let's pass it back to Val and we'll see if there's any other questions, but help us, Val, help us wrap up. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to give a quick uh, commercial for Insightly. And, but on the other side, we're going to hear, I think Jay's going to give us one or two tequila recommendations. And I think You're everyone's going to stick around to see if Lindsay's voice actually does hold out. So um, anyway, but Insightly is the modern scalable CRM that we like to say that teams love it. It's super easy to adopt, customizable, integrates with every other application to run your business. And we hear from customers as that ROI study showed that they're fully up and running within Sightly within weeks and growing 3x revenue. We also hear that they're significantly able to improve key sales metrics, increase pipeline, velocity, deal size, and deal predictability. They also love how customizable those dashboards are. They can report more easily, share company performance with leadership in a way that's consistent to understand and easy to interpret. Um, they're reducing errors and improving efficiency with some workflow automations. It's a very customizable platform. So um, with that, I will um, pass it back and see if we can get those tequila recommendations. And by the way, I think it's Marge Simpson's sister that has the voice, not Marge Simpson. So we'll see. <laughs> Yes, that's true. I think that's that's accurate. Uh, I actually just put out a video uh, on my Instagram channel, my tequila Instagram, which I'll put in the chat. It's um, uh, dot com slash tequila J Bear on uh, six reposados uh, for Thanksgiving. Uh, turkey and all the kind of Thanksgiving foods actually pair terrifically with tequila. Uh, so I would, if you can grab one, I really, really like uh, the brand Cascanes. Uh, it's delicious. I'll put that in the chat as well. They have a number seven Reposado, which I absolutely highly recommend. Uh, another brand that you can find fairly consistently now because their distribution is growing. A uh, big recommendation for me is Tequila Ocho, uh, O-C-H-O. Uh, their 2023 Blanco is, they do a, a annualized, almost like wine, 2023, 2022, 2021. The 2023 Blanco is spectacular. Uh, and it's like 40 bucks or something. So pretty reasonable. So there you go. There's two. Great stuff. I like I like, like them all. Um, Chip, any closing <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> tequila out my throat, Jay. Real question. No, it's not going to hurt weird. your throat. I can probably, it, won't, it won't hurt. I can't <laughs> promise it's going to help, but it definitely going to make it worse. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, where, where can you talk about MarTech and the Simpsons and tequila all of the same spot? And we have the answer for you today. So I'm glad you all showed up. Like, I'll leave it to you, Val, to let, wrap up. Nope. I appreciate everyone joining us today and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.